All right, welcome. And so excited that all of you are here to worship with us this morning. We want to say hello as well to our one o'clock service that's going to be watching this sermon as well. I have to preach at North Mesquite High School's baccalaureate this afternoon, my alma mater there. This is like the eighth year in a row that I've gotten the opportunity to do that. So I've got to get out of here a little bit early today. And so welcome one o'clock. Glad to have you guys worshiping with us here as well today. We are in week four of this series titled, Don't Be Dumb. And really, that's just good advice, isn't it? I mean, that just kind of works for every decision, every circumstance in life. That's just good, solid advice. Just don't be dumb. I mean, how many parents of teenagers in here find yourself thinking that or advising your teenagers in that, like on the regular? Like, just... Just stop being dumb. Like, that would make your life and my life so much better if you would just stop being dumb. I was a youth pastor uh, here for about 10 years or so before I stepped into my current role. And so I saw a lot of dumb, okay, over the years. I saw a lot of it. For example, uh, like the year that I was at youth camp and uh, I was staying in this hotel room. I was the counselor in this hotel room with a group of three high school boys. And these boys weren't really connected to sea life. Um, they, their parents had just sent them to camp, hoping maybe Jesus could fix them a little bit, I think. And so uh, I come home. I think it was the first night at camp. I come, since I'm like the youth pastor, I got to stay out late, like putting out fires, handling problems. Uh, well, whenever I come back to my hotel room, uh, I step in, and the whole hotel room reeks of smoke, cigarette smoke, and everything. So I'm like, ah, okay. I was like, who was smoking in here? And they're like, oh, no. And this finally, I, like, narrowed it down to this one kid. He's like, oh, well, my mom smokes. And so, like, my luggage, I just opened my luggage, and it just smells like so. And I was like, well, unless there's burning cigarettes in there with your laundry, I don't think that's the case. But I kind of, like, just told him, hey, listen, I'm not an idiot, but just cool it. Don't do anything else. You'll be good. I didn't want to... I didn't want to send them home on the first night of camp, you know. And so then like another night or two pass, and uh, I come back uh, to, my, to our hotel room, and I'm taking a shower in the shower, and I'm just, you know, toilet, doing my thing. And I, I look out of the shower, and I can see that underneath the toilet, there, there's something underneath there. And so I look underneath the toilet over there, and there's one of those little air freshener things, you know, those things with the jelly thing in it. And so I'm looking at it, but this, this air freshener has been manipulated and whatnot. And so I pick it up, and I look at it, and they've taken the jelly part out, and they fused it together and shoved a pin in it. I don't know what was going on, but they made a water bong out of an air freshener can. And I was like... I didn't know if I should be greatly disappointed or really impressed. One of the two, you know. But I remember just telling him, I was like, guys, like, who does this at youth camp, much less when you're staying in the youth pastor's room? I mean, come on, just don't be dumb. Don't be dumb. But that's probably sound advice that we could all use in our life. Don't be don't, don't, please, don't go home and try to make a water bar out of air freshener, okay? I feel like I should say that. Jesus doesn't want that for you this afternoon, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm preaching baccalaureate uh, this afternoon. It's Senior Sunday here today. I've got a principle that's good uh, for everyone, but I think is so incredibly timely, especially for our graduates today, because I know lots of people are thinking about their dreams and their goals in life, and a lot of people are wondering, what's going to become of my life? What's going to become of my dreams? Am I going to be successful? And there's tons of questions out there, and it makes sense. We can't perfectly predict the future, right? I mean, I think we all understand that. And, but, and I, I think this would be surprising, maybe for some of you to understand, is that we can actually come really close to being able to predict our future through this principle. And this principle, whether or not you know it, has been at work in your life from the very first moments that you took your first breath, and it is still at work in your life today. And here's the deal. Whenever you acknowledge this principle, when you understand the power that it has, it gives you the ability to harness it in your life. And the principle that we're going to learn today uh, has the ability to benefit your life so much, but if you ignore it, it also has the ability to break your life. Now, before I tell you what it is, just want to tell you a couple of details, a couple of other things about it. This principle is good for every single person under the sound of my voice in this room today. doesn't matter, Christian, non-Christian, 
a wise person, unwise, successful person, someone struggling in life, an introvert, extrovert, man, woman, doesn't matter. This principle is is at work in all of our lives. Number two, the principle will not fix or change your past. And I know that sounds fatalistic and a little bit discouraging, but it's just the truth. The past is, is the past. It is what it is. You can't change that. And oftentimes, um, people want to come and they, they ask us pastors or they ask their counselors for basically what amounts to a fix. But the, and because they're like, well, I don't, I don't like where I'm at. We'll see the trouble is you can't change where you're at currently because that was the result of all these decisions. Instead, you find yourself in a new place the same way that you got to this place by a series of decisions. And then the third thing I want to tell you about this principle is that it's at work even when you don't realize it. And so I also think that it's probable that there's a good number of people in this room who are living in the wrong direction. And right now you are the happiest that you have ever been in your life. Don't be deceived. That doesn't mean you're the exception to the rule. What it just means is that oftentimes the consequences to our decisions are lagging, right? So you make decisions and you don't immediately face the consequences of those decisions. Even the Bible itself, I love this, even the Bible itself says that sin can be fun for a season. I mean, even the Bible admits that. That yeah, sin can be really fun and enjoyable to the senses and to our fleshly side of us. But listen, there are always consequences and God's word is true. And so what do the consequences of living in the wrong direction look like? Well, it looks like turmoil and drama and unrest. It looks like discontentment. It looks like making wrong decisions around marriage, accumulating massive amounts of debt. It looks like damaged relationships. And so what's the principle? Here it is. Here's the principle. That direction, not intention, determines your destination. Direction, not intention. Intention, not your desires, not your hopes and dreams. That's all great to have, but that does not determine your destination. It's your direction that is ultimately going to determine where you wind up. And young people and old people, if we could all just recognize this truth, this principle that is working all of our lives, it would radically decrease the amount of dumb decisions that we make and radically increase our ability to make wise and best decisions in our life. You see, if I ask you about your intentions, about your life, about your marriage, about your career, about your family goals, I guarantee you, every single one of you in this room, you have goals, you have desires in each of these areas. But see, usually there is a disconnect between what we intend and what we actually choose, meaning which direction we go. And I don't want, and you don't want, God doesn't want you and I to be the victim of the disconnect. And what you need to know is that direction always wins. Direction always wins over intentions. And so people say, like young woman said, I want to marry a Christian man who shares my values. But in the meantime, I'm just going to date whoever. I'm going to date this guy because he's interested in me. Dad says, I want us to be a, a tight close-knit family, but in the meantime, it's just a really busy season of life at work. I've got to, I've got to get at everything that I have. If you're a grandparent, some of you in here, I want, to, or I, want, I want to live to be a grandparent, be able to play with my grandkids and see them walk down the aisle, but I don't really want to eat healthy like I should in order to help me get there. I want my kids to have a solid and good faith, but right now travel baseball demands that we be there every weekend. And once I meet the right person, once I get married, once I make more money, then I really want to be a generous person. I'm going to be a generous person. But just right now, I can't afford to be as generous as I want to be. So we all have great intentions and dreams and desires, but oftentimes we get caught up moving in the wrong direction. And my guess is that there's a bunch of people in here today that would testify that if they had to do it over again, they would choose a different direction in their life. And here's the good news. Um, I don't, there, there's not even really anything new for you to memorize today in regards to this principle because you already have this down. Uh, because whenever it comes to navigating from point A to B, like just driving from point A to B in your car, you know that if you want to get, for example, if you want to get to Austin, Texas, you don't get there by heading north, do you? 
No, you get there by heading south. And so you already understand this principle that ultimately your direction determines your destination. A few years back, my wife and I were uh, looking to buy a new car. And so we were, we were looking at used Ford Explorers. And so I was looking uh, all over and I found one uh, at, uh, online. There was this great deal, like this insanely good deal. And I call them up and uh, I ask them some questions about the car. And they answer the questions and everything sounds good. And I go ahead and pre-negotiate the price for this car because this car is down in Orange, Texas, okay? And so I pre-negotiate the price of this car because we are going to drive down there and I don't want to drive down there and have to haggle. So I tell you, if everything checks out with the car, I'll pay you this much. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. It's like, okay, everything's great. So uh, I take a day off from work. My wife takes a day off from work. We wake up super early in the morning and we start driving down to Orange, Texas. And when we get about an hour out from Orange, I call up the dealership on the phone and I, just to let them know that we are going to be there shortly. And so I'm talking to them on the phone. And they're like, okay, cool. About an hour out, great. What city are you driving through? And I don't, I don't remember what the city is. Let's just say it's Jasper. Okay, and, and so I'm like, I'm driving through Jasper right now. And they're like, Jasper? Why are you going through Jasper? Where are you coming from? And I was like, Dallas. And they're like, well, you shouldn't be going through Jasper. And I was like, well, what were you talking about? And they said, well, where are you, where are you headed right now? I was down in Orange, Texas. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like, we're not in Orange, Texas. You see, this, this website is looking at this car dealership. They actually had two dealerships. And one was in Orange, Texas. So if you know about Orange, Texas, it's five hours away, like on the coastline of Texas. And said so their other dealership, that's right, was in the home of Johnny Manziel himself. That's right, Kerrville, Texas, which is in <laughs> central Texas, like over four hours away from Orange. And so I had to, we had to just stop right there, re-navigate or find directions to Kerrville. And so by the time we got to Kerrville, we had already been driving for eight hours just to go look at this car. And just to add insult to injury there, we get there. And the Explorer had some things going on about it that they didn't disclose to us. I didn't feel good about it. And so we left and we went home empty handed. And so we arrived back in Dallas like 16 hours later after our tour of the entire state of Texas. <laughs> Direction, not intention, determines destination. It doesn't matter where you want to go. It matters where you're pointed. You want to know where your life is going to end up? Look at the direction that you are currently pointed in. And so you want to see how this principle works. Let's look at it in Scripture. A little context, 900 B.C., King Solomon which the Bible calls the wisest person to have ever lived, he tells what most believe to be a parable to illustrate this principle for a group of young men. And so there's two characters in this parable. The first one is a naive young man. The second is a seductive married woman. Let's dive into the text, Proverbs 7. He says, My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend. To keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. For at the window of my house, I have looked out through my lattice. And I have seen among the simple. I have perceived among the youth a young man lacking sense. And so Solomon is talking to this group of young men and he's saying, hey, listen, you are young and you don't know these things because you have not yet experienced them. But listen to me and listen to wisdom so that you can avoid this type of distraction because the most exciting diversion is still a diversion away from the direction that you ultimately want to head. And at the end of the day, a diversion is going to change your destination. And he's basically saying, you know, there's a difference between hearing wisdom and heeding wisdom. You can hear a lot of wisdom in your life, but that doesn't make you wise. You are only as wise as the wisdom that you apply to your life. He then goes on to tell him what he knows to be true because of what he has seen and experienced in his own life. And young people, listen to me. Much of what older people are telling you is, is to stay away from what has been birthed out of their own experiences. And that's why they're so passionate about it. And really, there's two ways to learn wisdom, isn't there? 
You learn wisdom from your own mistakes, and, or you can learn wisdom from somebody else's mistakes. And one way is a whole lot easier than the other. And side note to parents here, don't hide your story, your mess-ups from your kiddos. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's some, there's some points where you should practice a little discretion, maybe, uh, as you're considering talking with your kiddos just about some of the mistakes that you've made in your life. But listen, whenever you're coming down on your kids and you're just super passionate about something and you, you're given these rules or these commandments for them to live their life by, but you're not telling them why you're so passionate, why, you, why you're so convicted that this is the right way and path, it loses power for them. And share your story with them. And I'll say, young people, be warned if your parents or maybe even their friends or your coaches or your teachers or your CG leaders, if it feels like they're always trying to be a killjoy about some of the stuff that you have going on in your life, it might be because you're headed in a really dangerous direction. Uh, how many of you have you ever been driving, maybe in Dallas or, or somewhere else, you've been driving and all of a sudden you see a car driving the wrong way down a one-way one way road? You've seen that before, right? And it's like you start freaking out. You know, you're honking, you're flashing their lights, not because you're a killjoy, but because you are concerned because they are headed in a very dangerous direction. And some of you in here today, you need to realize that the people in your life that care about you, that they're not trying to kill your joy. They're trying to head you off at the pass because they can see the direction that you are headed in. And some of us, we don't realize especially whenever we were young, we don't realize that the decisions that we are making are plotting a course for our life. And other people can stand back and they can say, oh my gosh, it's just so easy to see from your decisions where this is ultimately headed, but you just don't see it yet. I'm preaching this good. I wish a parent would say amen right now. You know, <laughs> you out. Goes on, verse eight. Passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness, saying, under the cover of darkness, who is going to ever know? Who's going to ever, no one else is ever going to, this isn't going to affect my life because no one else is ever even going to know this. And behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart, and she is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. See, she's referring to some sort of religious practice, some sort of religious ceremony, and she's basically communicating to this young, naive man, hey, listen, I just got back from church. I'm not a bad person. I have good values, too. And she, she's basically saying, listen, I've emptied my sin bucket. Now let's fill her back up again, you know? That's kind of what she's saying. And she says, I looked for you. He's thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so special. And the narrator's thinking, no, you're dumb. And she's communicating. She, he's thinking, oh man, I'm one, one of a million, one in a million. And the narrator's thinking, no, you're one of a million. Verse 16, I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes. There, come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. And there it is is the diversion. And let's just assume he has dreamed of being a good dad, a good husband, a faithful man, and she is inviting him to go in a different direction than his desires and intention of his life. And then she reads his mind because you know he's thinking, well, what about your husband? Where's your husband? She says, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him at full moon. He will come home. She basically says, he's gone. He won't be home for a long time. It'll just be you and me. There won't be any sort of consequences as long as we don't get caught. And then verse 21, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. And all at once, he follows her. And we don't know where he was headed to begin with, but she convinced him to follow her. She convinced him to change his direction. But common sense tells us that as long as they don't get caught, you know, 
As long as no one sees or finds out, it's no harm, no foul, it's just fun. And he has likely convinced himself, I can make a wrong turn and still wind up at the destination that I want to get to. But Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, he wasn't finished. And he told the young man, verse 21, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast, till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. It means that he doesn't know it's going to cost him his dreams. Doesn't know it's going to cost him the vision of the future that he has for himself. He doesn't know what the costs are really going to be. And listen, especially young people, the costs are always so much higher than it looks like on the surface. He doesn't know it's going to cost him his very life. And now, oh, sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Uh, I love how Solomon puts it. I mean, it's it's just so uh, illustrative of of what he's talking about here. I'm not much of a hunter myself. I've never actually been hunting. Sorry to say that out in Kaufman, Texas, but it's true. I've never had, the closest thing to hunting I've done is hunting for a good deal at H&M. You know, that's about it. <laughs> and so I'm not much of a hunter, but I've heard deer hunters in here, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I've heard that among some deer hunters that they, sometimes they will actually use, there's this product out there that emulates like the smell of a doe in rut. Is that right? I don't even really know what rut is, but I've heard these words thrown around. And so, uh, Hunters will use this, this fragrance that smells like a deer in a rut that makes all the male deer like go crazy. And so usually from what I've heard, never, never done it once again, but from what I've heard, it's like the male deer, what are they called again? Bucks? What, are they called bucks? <laughs> Some of you are losing so much respect for me right now. <laughs> So you have, you have these bucks. From what I've heard, bucks are like usually, especially if it's an older buck, like he's, he's survived a bunch of hunting seasons, he's a little more wise than you know everything. It's like you're not going to trick a buck. Like you got to really work on him to, to kill a big old buck. And so, I mean, he, he's, he understands. He's seen lots of his friends die. And so he starts feeling some things are weird. And he's skittish and he's looking around. He knows stuff's going on. But it's like as soon as you spray this fragrance out there of a doe in red, it's like, huh? it's like, it's like. <laughs> And they're like springing forth in the meadow, like wide open. Where's she at? I'm in love, you know? Like, I know my soulmate somewhere in this hill. And then, boom, put them on my wall, right? You know, that's what you do. (laughs) Oh, man. Need y'all to calm down a little bit, okay? (laughs) Oh, man. It's amazing, though, sometimes how similar we are to animals, though, isn't it? And, man, some of us, we can live our lives with such wisdom and such character and such integrity. But let me tell you, you have an enemy, and he knows your number. And he knows how to make sin look so attractive to you. And you let your guard down, and you do it your way for a minute, and you step away from wisdom and God's standards in your life, next thing you know, boom, he's putting you up on his wall. And Solomon pulls out of the parable, and he speaks directly to the audience at this point, and he says, hey, listen to me. Do not let your heart turn away toward her path because she has brought down so many people. The translation is, you think this decision is a momentary diversion, but rest assured it is a change in direction that will lead you to a destination that you never wanted. And he he says, her house is the way to Sheol. You're headed down a path that represents death, death of your dreams, Death of your desires, 
death of the picture for your life that you have always wanted and been working toward. And if you go down that path, you will never be able to recapture it again. So what do you do? What do you do if you're on the path toward destruction? Well, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus offers some instruction. And so flip over to the New Testament. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and actually does them, notice he isn't offering a fix for all of their problems, no. Notice he doesn't offer a fix or a promise that their marriage will be instantly better, money problems go away, no. Jesus never offers a fix or solution, but rather invites people to move in a different direction. So he says, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and actually does them will be like a wise man who built, built, communicates that it's a process. It takes time. It's a habit. It's discipline. Jesus is communicating this idea, this principle that it, of delayed gratification. He says, the, the wise man who built his house, meaning his life, his relationships, all of it, took time. He says, the man who built his house on the rock. And in the first century, this communicated, this is the hard way. This is the way that's going to be longer. This isn't the easiest path. This isn't instant gratification. Like the wise man who built his house on the rock, and it says, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Because the wise man built his house on the rock, he didn't have to worry about the current weather situations. And he was ready because he chose his direction before the weather came, before the temptation came, before the trials came. He had already plotted his course. And he goes on to say, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. You see, the fool sees himself as being kind of like a computer, like a robot. You know, if I start, oh man, if things kind of lock up, if, if it's not working properly, well then just unplug it from the wall, wait 10 seconds, plug it back in, reboot, everything will be okay. But listen, the problem with that mentality is of like, I'm just gonna plug, I'm just gonna unplug and start back over. I'm gonna go away, I'm gonna find myself. The problem is that yourself was the problem all along. And you're gonna reboot. That's gonna be the same old thing over and over again, people think, well, I'll just get divorced, I'll, and then I'll get remarried, or I'll file bankruptcy. No, listen, because there you will be again, and that's your problem. No, your life has been moving in this other direction, away from God, away from his wisdom, away from his ways. You need to align your life to him. You are building a life on the sand, and if your house is, is devastated by the winds, and you build another one on the sand. Hey, listen, you're just waiting until the next storm blows through. No, build your house on the rock. And it says, verse 27, And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it, was, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And the implication is this. There is no fix. There is no fix. We have to rebuild, and it's going to take time. And if you had taken time up front to do it the right way, we wouldn't be in this situation in the first place. And somebody needs to hear uh, what I'm about to say here because you look around and you see other people and you just think, oh man, their life is just so great. And their life is just so charmed. Oh man, they are just so lucky. No, 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 no. Listen, no. They built their life on the rock. That's the difference. And the storms came. And it just exposed what that life was built upon. And so consider today's message, this passage, to be God honking the horn and flashing the lights at you. Just saying, listen, you're headed in the wrong direction. Like this is not the path to get you where you want to go. No one on their wedding day is dreaming about what their fourth wife is going to be like. No one, whenever they're taking their first hit, dreams about all the nice desert rehab locations they're going to get to visit. No one, whenever they're first starting their business, dreams about how one day they're going to be estranged from their kids someday because of all the hours they had to put in during these first few years. And what I'm saying is that everything in your life is found on the other side of a decision. 
and a choice. And the choice that you have to make is which direction am I going to go? And make no mistake, every single one of us in this room, your life is headed in a direction. And I encourage you to look at what and to do what Scripture commands us in Proverbs 4.26, where it says, ponder the path of your feet. Man, today, if you would just take some time to ponder the path of your feet, to just look back and just be real sober-minded about it, just be really honest about it. Man, what's my path right now? What direction is my life pointed in? And if I continue in this direction, if I continue walking down this path, what is the destination that it leads to? Ponder the path of your feet. And you may not recognize it, but your Father in heaven cares desperately about you and wants you to arrive in the best place. And how do you get there? Jesus says, build your life on the rock. Live your life the Jesus way and see where that takes you. And the thing that I love about God, because some of you, you've been heading in this other direction, okay? And you've left God way back here. You've been heading this direction. And the thing I love about God is as soon as you turn back to God, listen, God the Father doesn't stand there and he's like, see, told you, knew you'd be back. As soon as you turn, God doesn't look at you and say, come over here, I'm going to slap your wrist. He, he doesn't try to make you feel bad about the time that you turn. No, listen, instead of what Scripture actually says, like there's a perfect parable where Jesus explains to us what the Father is like whenever you turn from this wrong path and turn back to God's way and God's path. It's found in Luke chapter 15. It's the parable of the prodigal son where if you know the story, this son, he went out and he just completely turned his back on his father, completely disrespected him. And whenever he lost absolutely everything, I mean, it took him coming to the deepest, darkest pit of his life. But at least when he got there, he didn't have too much pride to keep him from turning back to his father. He turned back and he went back to his father's household. And listen, whenever he made that decision to turn and he started walking back, scripture says that while he was still a long way off, the father was outside the house on the hill looking, waiting for the day that his son would come back. And whenever he saw his son still a long way off, he girded up his robe and he sprinted toward his son. Listen, I, I know this message for some of us feels so condemning because we have walked down the wrong path because we have ultimately we've landed at the destination of our bad decisions. And here we sit amidst all the consequences and all the fallout and all the shrapnel of all of our bad decisions. But listen, you turn to God today and there can be hope and faith and life even in the midst of your consequences. I'm telling you today, no matter what path you walk down, you turn to God and he's not over there looking, yeah, should have come back sooner. He's not over there looking to slap your wrist or to rub your face in your, ba rub your, face in your bad decisions. But instead he's moving toward you in grace and mercy and restoration of relationship. Man, would you move to him today? But you turn toward Jesus. And listen, today you can make the decision, no matter what direction you've been moving down, that I'm coming back to the direction of God. I'm turning back to him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment? God, I know in a message like this, man, it's a somber message, and it's a, it's a clear warning. Uh, and so, Lord, I, just, I pray that we would hear these words God, and we put them into practice. I pray no one in this room would leave here and ignore the warning that they have just heard in their spirit from you, God. Lord, whatever the path is that we've been walking down, God, today we turn, turn away from that path we've been walking. We turn back to you. We want to walk with you, God. And thank you for your mercy and your grace that is made available through Jesus that no matter how far down the wrong path we've gone, it can all be wiped out. It can all be forgiven because of your son. And so, Lord, we love you.
We thank you for that. We are so grateful. It's in Jesus' name we pray.